Thanks uh, for having me and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about, a, actually I kind of had two topics. Um, one was to talk a little bit about the community and where we're at. Uh, I'm going to try to blow through that as quickly as I can. And then I'm going to dive into um, a little bit more detail uh, as Dan indicated uh, with respect to the uh, work I've been doing for projects and not just projects, but there's a bunch of other stuff. So. Um, so I, I think uh, Dan just already covered this, so I'm not going to go ahead and rehash it. I wasn't sure he was going to when I, when I made the slides. Um, but it's interesting that last bullet. So Illumos now is sort of like um, the college kid that has escaped its, its parenthood. At, at age 18, it left, and it's out on its own, its parent being Oracle's son, really son. Um, uh, the son, son got married and uh, I guess uh, we didn't really like our step-parent or our step-parent didn't like us and then we moved out of the house. <laughs> Alright, so uh, uh, some things that have happened recently uh, or, or things that are happening. Um, there's a bunch of stuff going on in, net, in, in uh, network virtualization. I think Ro uh, Robert's going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, virtualization in general. Uh, Brian's going to talk some things about some things about what he's doing. Um, I know, for example, though, that there's some other interesting work. I put Beehive up there. Beehive is an alternative to KVM. Um, it, it's BSD licensed and it's um, done in the FreeBSD community. Um, some of my co former colleagues from Pluribus have put that together, and they've got some impressive performance numbers. And we're hoping that that stuff is going to come back out. Right now, they've been busy focusing on upstreaming in Beehive, but hopefully, that'll come back to this community. Um, persistent L2 arc work has happened recently, not too long ago. Uh, I don't think that's upstream yet. I think that's in a separate tree, but it's been been posted. Um, the SMB the SMB work for SIFS, which is actually going to become very important as um, Microsoft virtualization becomes free and is dependent upon that. So, as an alternative to VMware, VMware being probably the single most popular NFS client in the world. Uh, now we're going to start to see the importance of uh, SMB 2 and 3 rise. And of course, Mac is, um, Apple is uh, doing away with Apple Talk and uh, favoring heavily SIFs. Uh, uh, there's been also some recent hardware driver work. So for example, STEC has contributed code uh, that um, uh, some uh, folks at uh, Lumos have been, uh, at Exente have been, have been working on there's been, a couple, there's been recent work for the uh, latest LSI hardware. Uh, there's been some new NIC drivers. So lots of stuff happening there. And then there's the work I've been doing around posits and compatibility. And I'm not the only one working in that space. But <clears throat> So if you think about this, it sounds like there's a lot of good stuff happening. And there is. Uh, yesterday, somebody posted that the last Linux kernel had nine changes per hour in it over the course of the release. Um, and I, my reply to that was, and that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, so we don't have quite that frenetic churn. Uh, and I think that that is a, is a good thing, really. We have a, a, a higher uh, expectation on stability. And uh, that tends to, to limit the rate of change. We also have a smaller community. But ultimately, what that means is that there's less risk for our downstreams, our downstreams being our users, the distributions, uh, the folks in the field who have to actually make all this stuff work. Uh, but our pace, I think the level of freneticism, or the level of activity, has, from its initial ramp up, when it almost started, has sort of leveled off. Uh, so on one hand, mitigating the low rate of change is a good thing. But I'd like to, I think a lot of us would still like to see a little bit more pickup. Uh, and a lot of, I think a lot of work is happening in, behind closed doors. Um, and it's not that it's, the doors are closed, it's just that people are busy, I think, getting work done. And we wait until, the, when the community sees it, it is a fully baked project. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the state of the POSIX in our tree as well. Um, so uh, we inherited from uh, Sun uh, mostly complete support for POSIX uh, 12001. Uh, that's also, by the way, uh, single Unix specification version 3. 
single Unix specification uh, merged with POSIX uh, in version 2, I believe. Um, so the places where we, where we fail compliance are mostly all the little uh, user land bits that are different um, or that where we didn't get open source for it. And so we've, we've got distributions that have made do with um, alternatives that are not compliant. Uh, we have, uh, as, a, as a result of some work I've done and have upstream, we have some minimal support for 2008, which is SUSE uh, version 4. And the minimal support we have there is, is, is really the locality object, which allows you to have thread-specific locales. This turns out to be important um, for, I guess, new GNOME updates, and there's a, I think there's a standard C++ library out there that, that wants it. Um, this stuff was originally done by Apple as part of their ex-locale stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty nice if you write multi-threaded servers that have to know about different locales, but uh, I, haven't, I actually haven't seen it much used in a while. I think it's still, still a little bit new, although 2018 is pretty, pretty much a long time ago. Uh, now, what's, the other thing that's interesting is that in, in our kernel, uh, we have a number of interfaces that were added in POSIX 2008, but are not exposed by default in our current tree, or not exposed by default when you ask for a POSIX 2008 environment. And the way you ask for an environment, POSIX 2008 environment, is you set a compile flag that says a, a, a macro, basically x open source equals 700. Um, it's basically referencing issue seven of that specification. Uh, so there's stuff in entry, but it's just not made available in the right environment. I'm going to come back a lot more to that. Uh, I'm going to continue a little bit with, the, with the, the where we are, though. So uh, we have, you know, in our in, Illumos is driving a lot of financial economic uh, activity. Uh, you know, I've put here. Uh, it's, I know it's I know it's more than 100 million dollars. It's perhaps a lot more than 100 million dollars. Uh, we've got kind of the old standbys that we all know: Exanta, Joya, Delphix, Omni. Uh, there's some other players doing product development or building products on on. Uh, Illumos, uh, Raptop, Pluribus is, is using, is using uh, Illumos. There's also some players that are, I call them stealthy, <laughs> maybe i being a little too generous here. Uh, so for example, I, mean, I know that Tengile's got a, got a product, they're using Illumos, and they're, uh, they started with OpenSolaris. Uh, and I'm, I, I've actually been very disappointed in them because they're not involved in the community, they don't give back their code, they're actually out of compliance with respect to the CDDL. I suspect there's more than just TGIL here. I would like to see these players, and, I, and, I've, and I've said this a few times without naming names, and this is the first time I've named names, but I would like these players to come into the, come into the open, as it were, and, and really support the community on whose backs they are riding. Uh, it would, it would be good for the community, it would be good for those players. That's, that's my take on that. All right. So we have some challenges and some opportunities in, in the Lumos, and let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, one, is the, one, is that one of our challenges is that we have no formal organization, which, all, which is a, normally a bonus, but it's also a problem because we don't have a way to make decisions that are not consensus, completely consensus. Uh, so, as a result of not, ha not having a formal organization, what, we, what are else are we missing? We're missing bounties. Uh, we don't have any kind of a, 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 a structure for actually dealing with money at all. Uh, we also don't have governance, which is maybe a good thing, but again, that means that we don't have a way to make decisions. Uh, we don't have ownership. Again, that comes back to finances. Right now, the Illumos trademark is uh, registered in my name. I don't have anybody to give it to. Uh, that, I, that I could, so it continues to be my trademark. Uh, we don't have anyone to, any kind of coordination or centralization around Illumos marketing and brand recognition. I believe that a lot of the problems that the community uh, has or, or with respect to growth and acceptance, and I've been in a number of play, places, uh, most recently my current employer, where getting Illumos accepted is a, is a very much an uphill battle. Um, and it's really a, a brand recognition and a mind share problem. 
And that really comes back down to lack of marketing, lack of, lack of awareness. Uh, we also don't have a legal presence, which means that we can't, as an entity, go after, for example, some of these actors who are, who are not doing things with the uh, IP that they, that they need to do. It also means, as I said, we don't have a place to own resources, money, uh, trademarks, uh, copyright. Uh, so there's also some opportunities here for other people to help out. Uh, so everyone knows that we all have lots of need, uh, need for uh, folks to get involved who are uh, deep engineers, kernel engineers. There's a lot of work, a uh, never-ending stream of work. But there's also an opportunity for folks who are not deep kernel engineers to get involved. And, and I'd really like to see this, some of these efforts ramp up. Uh, we have seen some of this work ha happening around the documentation. There's been a bunch of man page updates, for example. But I think that uh, there's a lot more opportunity. There's a, an excellent, excellent D-Trace guide up on dtrace.org, uh, and it, it does carry the most logo on the top. That is an excellent document. I would like to see more of that kind of document for our end users and our just, you know, consumers. Uh, it, it takes a lot of work, uh, no doubt. But uh, it's, that's work that uh, folks can do without feeling like they have to be a kernel hacker to, to, to to produce. Uh, localization work right now, we've got a lot of, of code that uh, has support for internationalization, but it doesn't, like this all this locale work I, I did, but nobody's localized it. So we're English only, only because nobody's done with translation work. Um, I don't know how much of a barrier this is for a Lumos acceptance internationally, but I know that the world is a lot bigger than the United States. Test development, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but there's a whole lot of, of things that could be done in this space. Uh, there's now some example code out there, uh, and I know that as folks have started RTI code, I've started asking for folks to produce tests to support the changes they're making, um, and I'm happy to help with that. Um, and you're going to see uh, in a private branch that I've got, I've got a, a boatload of, of, of test framework thousands of tests uh, that get executed. Um, and then marketing, which I've already talked about. So one of the key, key things for uh, this community, growing this community, is brand awareness and mind share. And uh, everyone, I think, in this room already knows about Illumos, I think, most, or most of us do. So it's me asking you know, marketing to this group doesn't make sense. But what we have to do is market beyond. We need to go beyond our traditional places that we talk to people about these things. Um, so the other thing is, Lomas has 100, it, there, there are about 150 contributors. I did a, did a uh, look over, over our code base. Since uh, Lomas is now four years old, uh, as, I, as I said, and in that time there's been about 150 unique uh, individuals that have contributed code to the Lomas code base. That's great. It's not as big as it could be, but it's still quite good. But there's also an incredibly bad downside. Here it is. We have not had, as far as I can tell, one woman contribute code to Illumos. Now, I don't know what the actual ultimate root cause of this is, but I've talked to some people, and I, I think part of it is not that our community doesn't, isn't uh, friendly towards women, but I think that we haven't reached out, and I think that there are filters in other communities. So one of my colleagues is a, is a, is a woman, female engineer, She's quite, quite good. She works in, in kernel, in kernel space, does uh, storage driver work. Um, she used to work at uh, uh, Fusion IO. Uh, and she told me that her experience working with the Linux community was incredibly hostile, the Linux kernel community, towards, towards women. I'm not a woman, I don't have those experiences. But what I'd like us to do as a community is fix this problem. This is not acceptable. I know that there's a problem with uh, uh, finding women who want to do this work. There's a, what, what is it called? The, uh, there's a word for this and I can't remember it now, but. Marketing? What? Marketing? Not marketing, but there's a, a source availability problem, right? Supply, it's a supply problem. There's a. Uh, the pipeline. Pipeline problem, thank you. Yeah. So, at the same time, I think that we're on the wrong end of a, of a very constricted pipe. 
And I think that that's, there are some of those constrictions are out, outside of our control. So one of the things that I think we need to do is figure out how we can open other endpoints to this pipeline that don't go through that constricting pipe. The, all, of the, all of the women that get turned off by, uh, by Linux, if we could, ca could have captured some of, those some of those people and got them interested in our community, I think they would have found us to be a lot more, a lot friendlier organization to work with. We are an organization that prides ourselves on, on operating on the basis of our technical merits. Uh, I think that contrib contributions to the community uh, tend to get discussed on their merits and they get discussed in a professional manner. So we don't have some of the same level of uh, emotional, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what the exact word is, but. We would, would you say that somebody here has mentioned empathy as a core engineering value before? <laughs> yeah, I think that that's true. I think that we, we do have that. Um, so I would like to take this time to personally invite if you're a, a, a technically inclined woman in the, in the sound of my voice, if you're hearing this, please, the community, we invite you. Um, you know, this is, this is an inviting space. I think that the engineers who do work in this space find it um, a friendly environment. Uh, there's no reason for you to deal with hostility elsewhere. Um, by the same token, so I've talked about that already, by the same token, if you're an employer, go out of your way. If you're, Bill, if you're hiring people, go out of your way. Look for some, some women. My experience working with women in uh, other organizations, so we have a, so we have a four to one ratio at, uh, at AMD, which is not something necessarily to be very proud of, but it's a heck of a lot better than zero to 150. Uh, my experience is that, they, is that they, they bring a lot to the organization. Um, and, and that's true of pretty much every woman I've ever worked with, not 100%. I mean, of course, it, it varies. But I highly recommend, go out of your way to try to find some women. I think that it will be good for the community. Um, and I think that that goes back to the marketing as well. So maybe our problem is marketing in different venues. All right, enough about that. Well, also, that coming back to the empathy as an engineering value, uh, I think we often focus on that as empathy towards the consumer of the product and not towards our peers developing. Um, it's easy to lose sight of, of having empathy towards your, your colleagues or, or prospective colleagues. So, so I'm going to try to repeat what you said because I'm not sure if that Mike picked you up. Uh, so what Theo is saying is that we have maybe made the mistake of having empathy towards our customers and not enough towards our colleagues and peers. Um, I think that's true to some extent, but I think that we, I think that's true throughout the industry. Um, yes, absolutely. I think we do a better job in our community of, uh, of presenting an approachable organization for developers though than perhaps some other, other communities do. Yeah, how many of you experienced people have helped news? or try to help noobs. I think, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And also, it's important, it's not the people who help noobs. It's the one or two people that are hostile. That, that's, the, it's not about how good the average or the 90% yeah. is. One, there has to be a low, a low tolerance and, towards toxicity. And, and that's, that's why the Linux community is so hostile. It's, it's not that they're all hostile, it's that it only takes probably two or three apples and then suddenly boom. It, it's definitely uh, assholes can in your community, yeah, for sure. So, yeah. you know, five quarters of those recently implemented a no assholes rule. So like, if you hit that mark, okay. Who implemented it? Pearl five quarters. Pearl, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think that our, our um, I'm not saying we're bad. And, right, it, the assholes are the plague of open source. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that, I mean, I think it's actually, there's a very interesting, if unfortunate argument you made that I think open source has arguably made this problem worse. Um, open source has, has been tremendous for in so many different ways, but I think one of the one of the negatives of open source that we don't actually talk about, we've seen this in the other communities we're involved in, which always give us great great appreciation for the open source community, um, is that because it's all comers and there's not an HR department in an open source community, and people will say things in an open source community that are that that are fired, they're unchecked, they're they're, they're, they're totally unchecked. Um, you can't fire people from an open source community, or you, you can try to ban them, but it's the, um, and then if you post that they that you would fire them if you could, you get you get, the internet dogpiles you. 
Um, <laughs> say. Um, but so I think that it, it, it's a problem we need to be really mindful of. I think yes. the, the um, our asshole rate, I think, is actually extremely low. Um, we got we got a certain we got some crazy people, and like crazy ha ha crazy and crazy actual crazy. But every open source community does, and I think that we do actually. I think guaranteed to underscore your point. I'm really glad you brought this up. I think we tend to be much more professional than the communities. We tend to be older, but more of us have kids. More of us have daughters. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, so I, I think that we all these factors. I think do, but I, 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 I think that the level of professionalism in this community is higher, and maybe a part of that is that that most of us have <coughs> professionally in, in in industry. So it's not just random obvious. Uh, I'm sorry. May I just interject? So as uh, one ex-person, I very like the almost community and how professional uh, people are. It's actually a pleasure. The, my biggest issue, and this goes back to what you were saying about opening pipe, is that there isn't really enough guidance about how to contribute. In fact, I've had trouble saying for Windows VMs in the past, just so I could jump through the build process that I needed in order to send patches back from CFS on Linux to Windows. And it'd be nice if, for instance, someone was to make a tutorial or something, being like, this is how you can set up a QMU VM very easily. This is how you can uh, just get a standard build, how you can apply even a simple toy path to maybe change the message being output to D-message during the system boot up, just so you can say this is how you build a patch and test it and so on. Or how you build the system, test it and so on, so you can then send it off to an advocate. Is that something that's been sorely lacking? And it's been something for barriers. There's only so much free time I have, and yeah. I really only do this every few months. I make an effort to try to set things up. So, so certainly there are some, I think that the way um, in which it, we contribute or, or accept contributions, it is a, it is a very high barrier um, for, for contribution. I think in some ways it's too high. Uh, in a lot of ways it's too high. But certainly one of the ways that we can um, deal with that and make that barrier low, lower is by um, improving the level of documentation that we have for the process that we do have. Uh, and that's something we, we should do. Uh, and I think it all always comes down to finding somebody to actually take on that job of, of documenting it. Um, but I agree with you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and carry continue on with my talk, though, if, if you don't mind. So one of the one of the problems uh, that, I, that I think that we struggle with, and this goes back to the marketing, is groupthink. Um, and the recent uh, the, the recent activities or, or challenges that the community has had around the bash, uh, uh, the shell shock and bash bleed bugs are, um, I think, characteristic of this. We have a, the internet has kind of a monoculture. Um, you know, what happened is we spent, the open source community spent, spent so much effort years ago trying to get uh, a Linux to get considered seriously. And, you know, great, we've got open source considered seriously. Um, it, you know, lots of people are, are using open source and building great stuff on it, that's awesome. But what's happened is that, that as I said here, people are sheeple. Every, you know, everyone, in, not everyone, but to a large degree, statistically it looks like everyone, uses the same stuff. And, no, and taking risks is challenging. And accepting a new operating system is considered a risk in, in a lot of business cultures. So it's sort of like the old, nobody gets fired by buying IBM. Well, nobody, these days on the internet, nobody gets fired by choosing Linux. Linux is the easy choice. Um, and that leads to a lot of, of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. By this, what I mean is fear of the unknown. Now, I don't mean FUD like, Salespeople mean where you, you're saying FUD, uh, you know, as a as a sales tactic. What I mean is the actual fear of the unknown, uncertainty about it, and doubt about it, and that's what's causing challenges. I think in accepting a Lumos in organizations that would otherwise be building interesting things on top of it. Uh, so that that does represent a, a substantial hurdle. Uh, one of the other challenges that we have in the community is drifted divergence. So we've got how many different forks and distributions out there? 
This is a good thing, it's an opportunity as well, because one of the things that we have is the power to go off and build interesting and cool stuff, but the forks are getting further and further apart in some ways, and it takes a lot of effort to bring things back together. I don't know how we solve that, and I don't necessarily know that we should solve it, but it is a, it is a challenge. Um, and, it, and certainly, you know, those of us who are maintaining a bunch of different, different forks, um, it would be helpful if we can try to upstream more often, I would say. Um, so, so one proposal for that, which would require a lot of work, is the smaller you make the gate, the less likely you're, it is. You're, I'm going to segue into that, all right? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, uh, did you read the slides? <laughs> I just wanted to add, as, as a recent uh, person coming into the community on you know, the mailing list, as an outsider, it does look like there's a lot of fighting over what the gate should be between the different districts. So I'm just that's a good point. That's a good point. And then and it's also a segue that I'll, I'm going to come in here. So, Mom and Dad love each other. Don't worry. So I, I, I spent some time thinking about, about a lot of these issues. And I've come to this, this sort of guiding principle. Less is more. And it has several different dimensions. Uh, those of you who run systems will appreciate this dimension. <laughs> Uh, and actually, I have now done just that, where I've made less, uh, I've taken less and forked it, and made it a better more than more, uh, but also more POSIX compliant, and ripped out in the process a lot of the, the cruft for Windows and OS2 and strange things. But it, um, so in my tree, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, less really is more, and it's uh, fully POSIX compliant, unlike, uh, unlike the upstream less. Here's another dimension, less blow, as we talk about. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of things in our gate that uh, nobody uses. There's a lot of bit rotting code, uh, and it takes a long time to build a gate. That's a barrier. Uh, it's not a huge barrier, but in some ways what we die is a death of a thousand cuts. So to the extent that we can get to a, a more common minimalist core, I think that that's a good thing. That's, uh, now there's a surprising one. Less compatible is more compatible. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that up till now, we have tried to remain compatible with a heritage that, come, that we get, that we inherit from Sun. That goes all the way back to BSD and XPG3, and POSIX from, 2000, uh, from 1988, and POSIX draft specifications, things that weren't even actually approved, but got encoded into our sort of genetic makeup. And, uh, and being strictly adherent to, to compatibility with that, we become less compatible with the entire rest of the software ecosystem. So all the Linux stuff out there that does things a little bit different, and I'm going to go, I'm going to dive into a lot, of, a, lot, a lot more of this. We wind up being, if we were less compatible with some of our, you know, we're willing to break away from some of the source, particularly the source compatibility, but even in some cases some of the binary compatibility, we could actually reduce some of the barriers to adoption and become more compatible with a larger ecosystem. Uh, here's another one. We spent a lot of time, I know I spent a lot of time on the list, uh, talking on IRC talking. Um, I need to do, and I realized I need to do, do a lot more, less of that so that I could do more coding. Um, and so with these kind of principles in mind, I went off and decided to basically fork a Lumos and go off and just focus on work. Work for a Lumos. By the way, uh, I'm not working on Lumos as part of my day job. Um, all of this is strictly a labor of love for me. Um, but I, I pulled away from the community a little bit. Uh, I stopped spending time advocating for RTIs and arguing about philosophical discussions on IRC and started focusing on code. And to that end, I created a branch. Uh, it's not actually a I've been maintaining a separate branch so that I can keep resyncing from master. Um, I call it almost core, um, and it has some strict specific values. Um, one of the specific values is to focus on the code. Um, 
Uh, as I said before about compatibility, standards comply by default. So I've made some, some changes that are perhaps contentious in other communities or in other group, groups, but really make, make, us, make this code base much more consistent with the rest of the, rest of the open source expectations, or not just open source, positive things. Um, Less is more, I've already talked about that as a core value. So all of those things I just said, this is, this is the vision of what I'm trying to get to. Self-hosting, what do I mean by that? I want to, I want to have just the, enough bit, I want to have the bits in gate necessary to build this thing. Um, I don't like having a lot of external dependencies, so I've made changes, for example, removing Haldi. Uh, why? Well, because Haldi pulls in uh, glib and dbus, and, and we don't need that crap in tree. Uh, and frankly, you will see when I pulled this stuff out, I, I made, I put the house stuff separately because that stuff is useful. So I pulled it, but I pulled it out of core into a separate consolidation, what I call a mini consolidation. It still builds with the same tools that we use for the main Illumos gate, but a lot of distributions don't need that. Um, in fact, the only ones that do are the ones that care, want to carry a desktop environment. If you're not carrying a desktop environment, you don't need anything in um, Self-testing, okay, this is, what I really want is core to become this, uh, this thing that we can use to val self-validate our code. So a lot of tests in tree, I've done, I've, I've done a lot of work here, and I can, I'll actually run a demo uh, in a bit. I'm probably way over on time, but. Um, you have uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, slightly less than 15 minutes. Okay, well, anyway, I might blow through that. Uh, so. You'll see what I mean. There's there's literally thousands of tests that I've added to the to the tree, um, and they do a lot for improving uh, the uh, confidence in what we have. And I ultimately, I think that 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 work becomes useful to all of the other uh, distributions, all the other consumers, because what I'd like this thing to be able to do is, for lack of a better term, I hate to use this term reference. But because it carries so many evil connotations, or perhaps conflicting connotations, but certainly having a, a known good answer that you can go to and say, "Hey, look, it works here," right? That you know, this is. I'm hoping that this this work will ultimately become uh, a shared base. Um, Cross-platform. So cross-platform means I'm not ditching Spark, um, at least not until we have something better. And what's nice is that if we get tool sets that allow us to support cross compilation as well, right, and running uh, in Kimu, a Spark emulator, um, and ultimately later perhaps ARM64. I know that uh, some people are working on ARM64 a little uh, in, in small bits at least. This allows us to start having an environment that builds kind of more like NetBSD, right? That if you've worked in a NetBSD environment, it's actually a very pleasant technical environment to work in from the perspective of building and everything that just works. Uh, the tool chain is all there, it's no surprises. So another key value here is that uh, RTI ready by default. So Solaris, SunOS used to have a policy of sh uh, uh, FCS, quality. FCS quality by default, FCS quality at all time. So, that's, and, I, and maybe, I, maybe by default is the wrong term here, it should be at all times, RTI ready at all times. So what that means is that the code has to maintain the same standards of quality, it's nightly builds, you know, it's, it's C-style compliant, you know, lint clean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A big piece of that is that, uh, or a, a big motivation behind this is that I'd like folks to be able to cherry pick from this stuff. Uh, and some of that's already started to occur. Uh, so, talking a, bit, a little bit about standards, and I, and I said standard, standards comply by default. Uh, I've colored these for a reason. If you go back, and, and the first one isn't really a standard, though, except perhaps by de facto, um, you know, we say that to get, to get uh, posits compliant, you have to add this XPG4 requirement. XPG4 is actually pretty freaking old. Uh, 
Even XPG4 version 2, which is single Unix spec specification version 1, is pretty old. <coughs> so what I have decided, and because we can't actually go and certify some of these older specs, and I didn't even put up the here SPID 3, don't even get me started on that, that's ancient. Uh, and there's no, not even a way to test for SPID 3. Uh, I have decided to, to more or less dispense with the statement that we're never going to be compliant or try to be compliant with these older specs. Because the reality is that these days what you need to be is compliant with the single Unix specification. And you know, getting, getting to SUSE v2 or SUSE v3 is, 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 is important, getting to SUSE v4 is important. Uh, supporting POSIX 1990, uh, that's much less, except insofar as you inherit that support as a consequence of supporting the newer standards. So a lot of those older standards get, have, have become subsumed into the newer standards. But offering a compilation environment, documenting that, that this is how you can get to XPG3, that's not really useful to anybody anymore. Just one question is, what do we do for application? Like, a lot of applications have the old minus D POSIX C source you know, for the original old invocation. Basically, they were built once. No one's so, trying to move it forward. So, so and kind what of how I, deal when there's so, conflicts there. So in my tree, I'm, uh, this really is, is a source compatibility issue. Yeah. Uh, what you're talking about is a binary compatibility issue. No, I'm actually referring to the source compatibility. I'm an I'm an application source base. I have like a very I have an older. I don't declare like x open source equals 800 or 700 or 600. I just have the older like POSIX C source. So, and are we, is that basically going to no longer work? So I haven't or? ripped that out, um, and it was not my necessarily intention to rip that out. But I'm not, I'm not making any statements about it either. Okay. Uh, I might go through and actually rip out some of the SPID three stuff because the SPID three stuff is there's no no feature test for that. There's no way to enable that, um, and frankly, I want to change. That you should get a modern environment by default, not SPID 3 by default. Sure. Um, so there's a bunch of old, and we talked about uh, Croft in the tree. So uh, credit to Alan C for noticing each table and get table. Anyone know what those utilities are? Mm -hmm. This stuff is how you would use <laughs> utilities to get and download from ARPA or whoever that was the, the host file when, back when the entire internet fit in a single host file. Um, the last time that was published, Dan, I think you were the one that told me. Dan was in 1990. Um, nobody, nobody's used this in a long, long, long time. I mean, they're tiny utilities, but it was like a little surprise, right? Wireless USB is DOA. Uh, stand, you know, they're useful technology, perhaps, if the standards bodies hadn't just thrown it away. Um, do we really? Do we really need 16-bit PCMCIA? Uh, yes, yes, sorry, we're using that. Joint cloud will open. I suppose you're using the uh, COF file format as well, right? <laughs> I, they, I was just going to say, yeah, I was going to say So, uh, so in my tree, I've ripped these things out. We, um, we use KSSL before, and we're very successful with it, as opposed to thinking about adding TLS support in. To drop and cancel out. I was disinclined. This is a choice I made to um, to expend that effort. Uh, it's a lot of effort, and these days we think that most people are running these technology, these these uh, services and zones. So in the KSSL and NCA bits are only usable in the, from the global zone. Um, and what's really evil is that. Uh, even if you're not using this stuff, or you're using using um, zones, uh, there's a bunch of checks and hot code paths for this stuff. Uh, so we think that with it's, it's possible to do that completely as a loadable module, though, right? I, I think it, it is. It's not how it's done, though. I mean, the KSSL is, but the problem is that to use KSSL meaningfully, you really need to use NCA, and NCA is not. Several. It's it's got its it was it had a, it was coded with its guts connected into SockFS, right? So I've gone and ripped that out of my tree. 
Thought um, you could use chaos to sell without it yet. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look at what we did. We have some stuff that okay, yeah. That. We'll take a look at it. I, my my concern was that, that nobody's actually updating and maintaining KSSL, right. and I don't like having a separate copy of SSL that, uh, with all particularly as we see, this is, and I spent some time in the code, and it wasn't beautiful code either, um, and this is in kernel code. So I mean, you've got two multiple attack vectors, right? You can use you can attack through the kernel. I mean, the problem here attack breaks not just SSL security. Which is like with traditional, but also breaks your kernel. So this is like a uh, this is stuff that I have to feel really, really confident in, and I just didn't didn't come away with that that level of confidence. Um, so an LMS hecky that's uh, uh, kind of scary stuff if you if you know what this is a Intel's AMT um, bits, and it's a way to use the local access the local AMT instance um, from your own system. I have never seen an actual use for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a bunch of ugly, ugly, really hideous C++ code. Just really, really gnarly. Because um, we all need more C++. Yeah. Yeah. So a little interesting case study. Uh, uh, Reader. So Reader was standardized in POSIX in 1995. There was a draft specification. So it was added in Solaris 2.6, maybe even earlier. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it was 2.6. Uh, and enabled by default. And Solaris is the, and Illumos, as a consequence, is the only operating system to still make this uh, the the drafts standard the one that is used, but not always by default. So there's an interesting set of conditions that have to arrive. Um, you get it by default unless you have you're, you've declared that you want POSIX compatibility, your more modern, modern POSIX compatibility. You ask for posits, p thread semantics. You're running, or you're running in 64 bit mode, or you've asked for large file support. In any of those cases, I mean, this is just a twisty thing. You will get this, this new, this different version of the interface. Um, and you want to note also carefully that the return semantics are different. Um, the, 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 uh, the old, Draft span standard returned a pointer and were null on error. So zero value, the meaning of zero, is actually inverted in the standard versus the non-standard. Um, so what was my solution to this problem? I added another case. But this case, it means that, that uh, this case is a new uh, condition, the SunOS source. And if you declare SunOS source, it means you want the old crappy stuff. If you don't declare SunOS source, you get the new. So by default, you will get the new. You will also get the new when any of these other conditions apply. But you almost everyone will get the new. You have to really go out of your way to ask for the old in order to get it. And this pattern, mod without the necessarily the uh, large file and uh, LP64 conditions is repeated in the TTY login and, and for um, uh, uh, get login and the TTY name under bar R. There, there's a few of these, a few other of these. So, what have I done in the last 45 days about? Um, well, here's a, here's a brief list of some of the things. This is not a complete list. Um, really, what I've done, I've committed actually more than 85. Um, it's about 87, uh, 88, something like that bugs uh, on RFEs into my tree. So I've really been focusing on the code. Uh, one of the interesting things here is the UNIM and PDP UNIM, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and that's this. So in my tree, I've changed UNIM. So this was a really big, ugly discussion a long time ago about how this was a bad idea. And I realized something. I'm talking about breaking standards, and I'm talking about breaking compatibility with the old. That's also contentious. When you consider either changing uname and the compilation environment, or changing the, these other standards independently, they, they both break. Because you know, on the one hand, if you don't, if you change uname, then all the tools, all that open source software that's got all the special casing for, if I'm on Solaris, I've got to do this crazy Byzantine thing. 
and there's a lot of that, pearls. If you change the crazy and fix the crazy and Byzantine stuff and you don't change your name, then it breaks. But if you actually change both so that you become more like a posits environment and you change and you change your identity so that it's not Solaris, you're not SunOS anymore necessarily, you're something else, then the fallback default should be posits, posits APIs. And so the, kind of the idea here is to be able to change both of these together. And so the uname changing was one way. Now, that said, there's still a bunch of stuff that breaks. Um, and, I've, and I've found some of those desk corners. I've created, the way I did this was I, I set a uarea fl flag. Um, and I created a proc tool, puname, uh, that allows you to change your uname. And you can. By changing your name, it's a single bit flag. So in the code, it's considered the alternate U name. And the alternate U name then is SOS 5.11. Uh, and you get a way to do that. And because it's a prop flag, it's inherited across forks. I can set it on, a, I can give it a process ID and set it on my own process ID. So I can change my shell and carry forward. If I'm a distribution and I want to use this, I can just change this in, in my um, init script, right? I can set this at very early in boot, um, and the rest of my environment will still remain uh, SunOS 5.11. But I can also do it selectively, which turns out to be incredibly use useful. Um, so because, it, as I said, most of the things break. 64-bit studio breaks badly. It wants a 5.7. Why? Because 5.7 was when 64-bit support was in it, offered in Solaris. Um, Haldi was brought busted. Um, I fixed that and then I pulled out the out and I put my, that in a separate repo along with my fix. Um, sadly, X requires a Haldi, so if you don't have Haldi on your system, you will not get a working X. Um, I've offered to fix that for LMC, so it's on my list of things to do. Um, and really it's because it, you, X wants HAL for input. Um, all the auto tools break uh, because config.guess basically builds out and says, I don't know what your system is. You can Give it something else. We need, we need to get the autoconf tools um, updated. I have not asked to do that or push for that yet. I think I need to have a set, at least a second user of my system before that's interesting to them. Um, that said, I don't think it takes more than about two or three because Aurora UX got their stuff in, in autoconf tools. So uh, package depend. This may be fixed. Um, I did notice the package depend broke on my system or a long time ago, but now I can't find on my system the broke, break, broken library anymore. I think I did a package image update and the old dependency went away. Uh, the dtrace printf test fails because it explicitly checks for uname minus s <laughs> equals s. So that's a trivial fix. Uh, I haven't actually changed that one in my tree yet, um, but you can run it with the uname minus s and you won't have a problem. So what's needed necessarily to continue to work for 2008 POSIX support and ultimately for C11 support. Uh, there's memory streams, there's dprintf, which is a universal will explode when that gets enabled by default. In our own tree, we have a bunch of stuff that has dprintf. Uh, curses upon the, the standards committee for choosing that as, a, as an interface name. Um, there's some additional dthread related work, um, some interfaces. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that we'd like to do for C11. Robert's done a lot of work in that along those lines. Uh, there's additional effort there. And most of the, most of the stuff that's happened there is stuff that interfaces that you can use that actually improve the security um, to some extent. Uh, some of the POSIX 2008 interfaces, the uh, AT file stuff, it also allow you to, to get some close tradition, some historical race conditions. In a shell space, we've got some stuff we need to do. We need a, we need a uh, compliant PAX. Uh, I'm not interested in STAR. Uh, Awk is NOC now in my system, um, but mo we need to modernize NOC to get to, uh, as I said, I'm probably going to through time. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, we need to modernize NOC, uh, and the nice thing is Kernigan has got a current update, so the, if you actually go to the upstream, it's possible to comply now. And then we, that'll get us from four AUX to one. Uh, there's a lot of little, little stuff in a bunch of utilities. I've started some of that. Um, 
The replacement KHH 93 with dash and libetid is not necessarily needed for posits, but, it's, but it is needed from the perspective of actually having a non buggy shell and one that's e that I can actually maintain. I think the upstream KSH 93 is probably a lot better than what we have in tree um, in terms of, of not being broken. But at the same time, I don't want to pull in their idea. I mean, their idea is to, to subsume the universe in KSH 93. Um, I don't think that's a good choice as for a, root, for a basic root shell. And I think that the bash uh, incidents will support me on that, at least in principle. Um, there's a bunch of test suite development uh, and going through the standards and making sure that we actually are compliant. If you want to help, yes, you can. I take pull requests. There's a lot of work that can be done. If you want to help collaborate with me on some of this stuff, I invite. This is the first time I'm saying I've said this openly, but I'm now inviting people to participate. You can cherry pick, you can code review, um, you can contribute. One of the things that I would like Illumos Core to become is sort of a more advanced experimental system and platform for experimentation. I think that it should be easier to get into than Illumos Gate. I think that there's a lot of downstreams on Illumos Gate that actually need have a higher demand on stability and resistance to change for, for excellent commercial reasons. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to have a platform and a place for us to share and continue to evolve the system in perhaps some more contentious ways. And I'd like the Lumos Core to become that. Uh, so here's some things that, that can be done, as I said, code and doc, all the stuff I just said. Where does it live? I'm on Bitbucket. Um, you have to look at the core branch. We could put this somewhere else. It's just, it's there because I need a new place to put it there. So with that, thank you very much. Um, I will do one quick thing here. <laughs> well, you can see there, just out of curiosity. I can change my shell too. What's the privilege profile for PU name on your PU? Is it like? It, it basically follows uh, other the other proc settings. So, okay. um, it, okay. It's consistent. So, so yeah, normal yeah, user can change his own shell. The super user can change other people's shell. Okay. You can't change somebody else's. Okay. Uh, it's not just shell. You can just, I mean, it's any process. Right? Yeah, um, so actually, to get Haldi working originally, I put pu name on ss dollar dollar or p dollar dollar in its SMS startup script <laughs> at the top of it, and I've done stuff like that in my build tree to get Lint to work. Um, I've changed the definition for Lint to just prepend this pu name. To it, and I've been, you know, I've been running this way for uh, about 45 days. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to show you very briefly was what's in the test suite. Um, so, as part of this, what I have done is I've written an entirely new um, test suite that I call symbols. Um, so what symbols is, is it tests for uh, this symbol visibility and do we, do we expose symbols when we should and do we suppress them when we should and do they have the right prototypes? Uh, so for example, and I've organized them for no good reason, actually this book is standard out age. Uh, for no other reason than just organization, I organize these by, by header file. Uh, and you can see that, for example, here's some, some, some symbols that are required by SUSE v3, and so later on, some ones that are required by SUSE v4. And by the way, this positive uh, one, the plus on the end here, means that it's also required by SUSE v4. Uh, and I have uh, function entry points, stuff that requires. POSIX plus, and there's a bunch of, bunch, of, bunch of different standards. But what this allows me to do is declare, let's say, for example, the symlink app, which is required by, it should not be exposed in anything except a uh, POSIX 2008 or SUSE v4 environment. So this test verifies that this function with this prototype is exposed only in that environment. Uh, 
actually do a quick run here. And I said a quick run, it'll take about 30 seconds. Uh, there's other ways to run this that are cleaner, but I, this one will let you see what actually happens. So in each one of those is a compile test. It's actually spawning a compiler, doing its trivial compiles, and if the compiler errors out, it or it doesn't error out, depending on the case that it's testing, it'll, the test will fail. Is this test suite cross platform? So could you run it on another system? Or it could be. System? Oh, you know what? Look. Huh? Oops. Um, it failed. Uh, probably because I'm actually not running. Did you pee your name, Michelle? No, this is not. Yes. It shouldn't matter. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. But you're right, I did. <laughs> and I can actually undo that, by the way. And just out of curiosity, uh, the reason for 49 is that's the number of months since April, uh, since August. Uh, 2010 when I announced um, Lumos. My intention is that there will never be a 1.0.0. I don't want to have to deal with that politics. So when we go, when will this become 1.0. anything? When I, I think when I achieve the level of self-hosting that this becomes more generally widely useful as a, as a complete entity, I'll, I'll call it 1.0. But it'll be 1.0. dot some big number. Um, so there'll never be a 1.0.0. That's a, just a, uh, to avoid the, that stigma. So that's, that's it uh, for, for this. Um, any questions, thoughts? Before I get pulled off the hook, stage of the hook? On the test suite, is it cross platform? So can you run this on other systems as well? Uh, I think you could. I mean, it, let me, I'll actually show you where it is. So in here, there's this thing called symbols test. Um, the only thing is that I think that it does have a little bit of knowledge about the compiler paths. Uh, the actual rest of the test is completely config file driven. Uh, let's see. It's interesting that that file still exists, but I can use it. This is actually how I defined the compilation environments. So these are all the things and environments you could test for or name. And you can list them individually, or you can list them as a, as a group. So this allows you to reference the group is everything after, is the idea, so that you can start from. And you can add an invert, so you can say everything. There are some symbols, for example, that are removed from POSIX 2008. So like V4 is not ex should not be expressed in a POSIX 2008 environment. So what you can do is you can say all plus, and then Minus is before, right? Which means after that, after that point, it should be suppressed. Um, and the actual test suite itself is written in C. So, yeah, I'd be happy to have other people actually take a look and, and see if this is useful to them on, on other platforms. The, the test run, which we didn't get to see because it failed, um, now I'm wondering, I think that what's happened is, is that I'm running an older version of, I, I um, booted to a, a previous boot environment um, because I was debugging another problem and that get login test was in the newer, it's only correct in the newer environment. Um, that was one of the symbol, default symbols I fixed. But if it runs completely through, it runs over 3,000 tests. Um, and it tests both uh, I386 and AMD64 compil compilation environments. And you can define new compilation environments as you can see. It's just config, config file setting, um, which hopefully will allow us to really. Um, Could you just get a complete list of all the tests that pass or fail at the end? Yeah, I was I was running it in the more verbose mode for the purposes I wanted to see the big number at the end. Um, normally, each test gets run as a separate sort of a separate suite. 
the, the result is very is, is condensed, and you just get the kind of a more of a summary view. Um, so if you run the, the, the test suite by default, that's what you get. The same as the other the other test suites. And I've added tests for FX, FXEC VE. I've added a test for uh, there's some like open dir, open O under bar directory is a new um, thing for open that says fail if it's uh, not a directory. So I've added test suites for those. I'd like the people to do a lot more. There's a lot more um, opportunity to create tests to really prove that we are not breaking and that we are you know, compliant to the documented interfaces. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you.